Well, good morning, and uh, we're so glad that you're here this morning. I want to give you a couple of announcements. Uh, one, this morning, uh, in just a few moments, we'll be recognizing a, a couple of our graduates uh, that have achieved that first big milestone of their life uh, by graduating from high school, and so you'll want to... Uh, uh, you want to congratulate them after you see, see them uh, today and uh, for their high school graduation tomorrow. Uh, a couple other things we want to make you aware of is that uh, sign-ups for Vacation Bible School are now live. And so in the main hallway, uh, it's July 22nd, 21st and 22nd. Uh, we're looking at help for that. And so if you would love to man a station or be a part of anything there, then please go see what's available there and, uh, and sign up for that. Um, there are several different prayer needs on the prayer slide as you see it come through. Uh, and so be aware of those. And if you have a chance, maybe even this week, write a note to someone or send a text and say, Hey, I'm praying for you. I love you. Uh, hang in there and uh, let me know if you need anything. Then that would be, uh, that would be very appropriate. So, but for now, let's get our, our service started with songs. So Art, come lead us in our call to worship. Stand together as we sing, Give Me Jesus. saying, you're going to have a people, you're going to have a son, 
And at that moment is when, uh, it's probably the more familiar story that we're, that we're familiar with, when he takes him outside and he looks at the stars <coughs> and he says, this is, this is what your descendants are going to be like. And there's a phrase there that says, and Abram believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now he has believed God before, but we haven't had that phrase, it was credited to him as righteousness. And that's going to be a, a point in which people think that that's when, that's when Abram was born again, he was saved, he was redeemed, was that there was a, there was a movement of God to, to save him because of his faith and because of what God had, had done in his life and was telling him. And that's going to carry through the New Testament in a key argument of Paul when he comes to the book of Romans. And he's reminded... He's reminding the, uh, the, the Jewish Christians um, who are believing in Jesus that, that Abram was credited with righteousness long before the law ever came about. And Moses is not on the scene. As a matter of fact, in our, in our story this morning, uh, the Lord is going to tell him, you're going to have a people, but they're also going to be enslaved in a foreign land for 400 years. And then we know that that's when Moses comes. So you've got several, several hundred years before the law comes, before Moses comes. And the crux of Paul's argument is that <clears throat> it's not the law, doing the law, depending on the law, that, that makes someone righteous. Because righteousness was credited before the law was ever given. But that depends on faith. Faith in God, in the work of God. And so Romans 4 is going to complement what we're looking at this morning in, in Genesis 17. And we're going to read portions of chapter 4. So I want to begin in chapter 4 and read 1 through 5 and then skip down to verse 16. So Romans 4, 1. <clears throat> what then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works... He has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as as righteousness. Now let's skip down to verse 16. <clears throat> that is why it depends on faith. In order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring. Not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham. Who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. Fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. This is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words, it was counted to him... We're not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, as we, as we come to you this morning, we have a need for you. We have a thirst for you. We have a hunger for you. Uh, we want to know you more than we want to know anything else in the world. And Lord, we may not admit that. That may not be on the front of our mind. But God, deep in our souls, deep 
deep, underneath, underneath everything else and all the layers, deep down, our greatest desire is only satisfied by knowing you, by being at home in you, by loving you with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, by giving of ourselves and loving our neighbor as ourselves, to find our home in you and who you are and what you mean to us is, uh, is the satisfaction of our deepest thirst. So Lord, we come into this place and we've been beat up uh, by the world. We're tired. Uh, we are in need of, of courage. We are in need of grace. We are in need of hearing yet again the truth of the gospel of Jesus, that we are great sinners, but that he is a great savior and that he will save to the uttermost all those who believe in him. And Lord, I pray this morning that like Abram, we will look at our lives and then look at the promises of God and and, and not be able to see any connection whatsoever and see a gigantic chasm between where we are and where the Lord promises that we will be and what is true of us even now, that we're being renewed on the inside, but outwardly we are decaying day by day. And so, Lord, give us, give us faith, give us trust to, to believe the promises, even when our eyes consider ourselves and our circumstances as being against, seemingly against what you've promised and your will, and yet trusting that you will make a way, that you will conquer, that you will overcome, and that you will receive the glory for it because of these things. So Lord, help us to believe and help us to trust. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Giving consideration to this morning's worship. And being graduate recognition Sunday, I wanted us to to uh, have our songs kind of dovetail in with that. And so in Lamentations three, uh, the writer is talking about affliction and uh, his bitterness and the things that he's he's dealt with. But he says, "I I will remember them." Speaking of all that affliction, he says, "And my soul is downcast within me. Yet I call this to mind." And therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. So I would say that as an encouragement to our graduates this morning. That in the days ahead, whether you're going to work or going to college or, or neither of those, you're going to face some trials and tribulations in your life. But just let this song, Great Is Thy Faithfulness, be an encouragement to you <coughs> that God is forever faithful and you have hope. Beyond that exam, beyond that, that whatever it is that you're facing, you have hope. Let's stand together as we sing, Great Is Thy Faithfulness.
continue to worship our great God and sing how great is our God. Genesis chapter 15. Genesis 15, we will be looking at the whole chapter. Oh, 
on Abram's call. I got to thinking this morning about whenever I have an introduction, um, I would like to combine, if we're doing something that's kind of uh, a special and, and at the end what I like to do is invite our graduates up and, and give them something and, then, and pray over them um, as we end the service. But as I think about um, that, I wanted to combine it with where we are already, and so I, I started thinking about, okay, what does graduation have to do with righteousness credited? What does graduation have to do with credit? Credit cards. Because when you graduate, uh, what's going to happen is if you go to a campus or things start showing up in the mail, you will start being uh, courted by all of the major banks for a credit card. And uh, so while I say congratulations, graduates, well done, this is an important milestone, uh, you will begin to get offers from credit cards. Uh, and, and those offers start early. Some of them like, are like when they're 10, 12, you know, they get the names. Uh, I know because I'm already getting like AARP stuff in the mail. <laughs> and I'm like, too soon, right? Too soon. Uh, you will begin to get offers. There will be reps on campus urging you to commit to them. And let me just give you a fair warning, and this is a life lesson. If and when you have to give your social security number, it's a big deal. Whatever it is, it's going to be a big deal. Uh, so here's the idea behind credit cards and credit. The idea is that you don't have the money, but there is a big bank that says, don't worry about it. We got you. Go ahead, make the purchase. We'll pay for it, and then you can pay us back when you get the money, plus interest, right? That's purchasing on credit. The bank is giving you something that isn't yours, their money. You'll use it and then pay them back. In our passage today, God credits Abram something with something that is not his. He gives him something that we don't have on our own. So there's four things that we're going to look at, but first let's get into the text. Genesis 15. It says, after these things. Now I want to pause right here and remind us of what these things are. Last week we looked at this. Well, really the last couple of weeks. There was a war, right? There was a war that broke out. Four kings against five. Um, some had been kind of over the others. The others said... We've had enough. It's been about 12, 13 years. We're going to rebel. They rebelled. They regretted rebelling because the other kings proved while they were in power, they beat them, they defeated them, they took them. And then Abram heard that his nephew, Lot, had been taken as well because the king of Sodom was one of the kings. And so he took the men trained in his house. He went after him. He rescued Lot, brought back all of those things, and met Melchizedek. We looked at his priesthood last week. And the king of Sodom, at the same time, said, I tell you what, Abram, you've done us a big solid favor here. Uh, just give me the people. In other words, I'll continue to rule all them, but keep all the goods for yourselves. You, you've done a good job today. Man, enjoy some of, the, some of the spoil. And Abram rejects that, and he says, no, I don't want anyone to ever perceive or for you to use it as leverage later that you made me rich and understand that there's some sort of treaty or obligation here that's going on. So he rejected that. Now that's going to be an interesting part because when we come here, then the Lord is going to say, Abram, I am. I'm going to be your provision. I am. So you did the right thing in, in not seeking provision from the kings of this world because I remain the source of what you need. So when we read in Genesis 15, after all of these things, then he has the Lord come and meet him in a vision. So Genesis 15, after, all these, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. <clears throat> Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you've given me no offspring and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. 
And he brought him outside and said, look toward heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O oh Lord God, how am, I, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down to the carcasses, on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. <clears throat> when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. So it's a beautiful story because it gives us a, a pretty clear progression, right? That these are the things, this is uh, the Lord comes to Abram, he has a conversation with him, it says, as the sun is going down, and then there's another part of the conversation. And then when the sun had gone completely down, and it was dark, then something else happened. It's just a beautiful progression of the story. Here's a few things that we can take from this. Number one is this. <clears throat> God is faithful to seek our good and to tell us through promise. He's faithful to seek our good. You know, there's, there is nothing... If we go back to Genesis 12, the first time that the Lord ever appears to Abram, Abram's, he's just living life. There's, there's nothing that he has stacked up that the Lord looks at and says, you know what, out of all the people on earth, Abram really got his life together. I, I could use a guy like that, and so I'm going to enter into a covenant with him. No, there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing that Abram has done. The Lord selects him. And says, Here, I'm gonna, I am going to make of you a great nation. Doesn't have a child. His wife is barren. He is now, after hearing this promise a few times, is now approaching 100. And it still hasn't happened. But the Lord has selected him just because the Lord wanted to. No other reason. There's nothing that compelled that drew something out of God towards Abram. He's faithful to seek our good. And he's seeking his good. And then to tell us through promise. When he comes to him this time, he says three things at the very beginning. Fear not. This is a very common greeting when the Lord is appearing to people through Scripture. There are times he speaks to people, but when he appears, even in visions, there must be something that strikes fear, that makes the hair stand on your neck, that gives you a chill, that makes your heart skip a beat. You know, I'm talking AFib here. If you've never had that before, it's quite a rush, okay? <laughs> it's not a rush. It's concerning. Uh, but, you, but, but it happens, and you feel like, wh what was that? Um, there was a period when I was early in ministry here um, that, I would, that my heart was having some issues, and I think it had to do with relating to the pressure of preaching, and it would happen on Sundays. But then it started to happen like throughout the week. It was a very strange thing. The Lord has delivered that, and it's a good thing, but it, would, it was this breathless kind of the wind is knocked out of you, and you don't know what's going on, okay? But when you're in a room, and it makes you really still for a second, do you know, like when you, when you, when you legitimately hear something at night that's not just the whatevers, but 
kind of like, you know, what was that? Like, like kind of just makes you sit up for a second and, and, and then like that cold chill comes over you. You multiply that times, you know, infinity. And when the Lord appears, he always starts out with fear not. Fear not. There must, there must be something. And it only makes sense that there's something, right? It's the holy God of the universe who has no limits, who is all-knowing, all-powerful, who is completely holy, who is eternal, and, and appears in a time and space with us. When we come up against that, yeah, we ought to feel that. It is real for us to feel that. But he tells them to fear not. And then he says, I will be, be your shield. Now, I would imagine that Abram was laying fairly low until he went after Lot. Right? But now, after his defeat of Shedder the king, he is on a map. A target might be on his back now. The other four kings couldn't defeat this guy. And Abram took the men trained in his household and defeated this guy. Maybe even from the other side as well. Sodom's side. He rebuffed that king's offer to keep the material goods, which may have been an effort at some sort of partnership or treaty, but Abraham dismissed it on the basis of the fact he sensed the same thing, that in the future the king would use that as leverage against him, and Abram said no, which may have left him with a less than ideal relationship with him as well. So the Lord says, Abram, I know, your protection is not coming from these guys. Your protection is going to be from me. I will be, be your shield. You don't need to fear Shedder Lomer. You don't need to fear Sodom when you have me. I will protect you. I will preserve you. And then he says your reward will be very great. This is over and against the reward of the king of Sodom, who just tried to give him all the material plunder the other kings had made off with. But Abram won it back when he and the men of his household rescued Lot. But Abram refused the goods in faith, knowing that the Lord, the Lord will provide for me. What a beautiful act of faith. So God promises, fear not, I will be your shield. Your reward will be very great. And then he says, well, I don't have a child. You know, I want to believe this Lord, but when is this going to come about? Right now, Abram's looking ahead. He's making plans. You know, I've got Eliezer. He's the most faithful of my household. And the Lord says, it's not going to be him, man. Your heir. I know that you're trying to work all these things out in your mind. And, and don't, don't we, don't we, don't we spend so much effort and energy working these things out in our mind? And how many times, how many times has it worked out exactly like we've worked it out in our mind, you know? How many times have we gotten to the end and been like, that's exactly what I thought was going to happen? Zero, maybe? Zero? A half, maybe? Every now and then we're like, well, I mean, you know, it was, it was for a couple of steps it was good. So Abram is looking ahead and he's like, okay, I'm making plans for my estate. And I just don't see how the Lord's promise, when this is going to work out, and the Lord says, don't worry. Don't worry. And so he takes him outside and he shows him. He shows him the stars. Now, here's point number two. We believe, but we need help. And we believe when we behold God. We don't just believe like the Lord says something. We're like, okay, we believe it. We believe, but our faith needs help. It needs, it needs, it needs a stepladder. It needs the Lord to help us out in this direction to believe. And God knows that of Abram. He knows that he's weak. Psalm 103.14 says, he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. God knows us and that we find it difficult to trust him because his ways are so much higher than our ways and his thoughts are so much higher than our thoughts. This is normal. He's compassionate, he's merciful, he's, he's patient with us. He knows that it's difficult for us to trust him. He knows our limits, our finitude, our smallness, our brevity of life. Matter of fact, the next verse after Psalm 103.14 says, as for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field, for the wind passes over it and it's gone, and its place knows it no more. That's what man is like. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him 
and his righteousness to their children's children. So there's a contrast in Psalm 103 of the a people that are like the grass and the flowers that are alive today, but they're, they're dead tomorrow and time keeps on marching on. But the love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting and on those who fear him and his righteousness. We believe, but we need help because we're broken and our frame is dust. So God himself contrasts us with him and knows our limits. He shows him the stars. He shows Abram the stars. He takes him outside. He brought him outside and said, look toward heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. He said, so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord. He shows him the stars to remind him of who he is, of who God is. The one who created all these stars by a word in Psalm 147 says, knows them by name. And he reminds him who Abram is, the one who will pass away long before these stars do. And in that moment of worship, in that moment of worship and seeing God's handiwork, Abram is reminded how powerful God is. And he believes him. He believes him. So it's not like Abram has completely blind faith. The Lord helps him by revealing himself in his created order. And Abram says, ah, I remember you're able to do this out of nothing. You can do this with me. We believe Standing there beneath the stars, even though he'd been told many times, he believed God. He believed God. He trusted him. He knew what he was going to do, what he promised. Number three is this. God gives us what we need most, righteousness. God gives us what we need most, righteousness. So it would be an inspiring story if he says, so shall your offspring be. And, and it said, uh, and Abraham believed God. And we'd be like, so you should have the faith of Abraham, that you should believe God's promises. But that second phrase, that second phrase is the turning point of so much of Paul's argument in Romans 4 and in the book of Romans uh, and in Galatians that we read just a moment ago. And he credited to him as righteousness. This isn't just a story about living by faith, which is important. But many today would say that they're people of faith. You know, that's just a generic a generic phrase. But when you start to say, okay, but in order to know a holy God and to be with a holy God, you have to be righteous. You have to do right all the time. Now, does that describe you? No. Does that describe anybody? No. So it can't come from within. Uh, the, uh, the world says, I heard this years ago from, from a, a professor. The world says... The problem is outside of you, and the solution is inside of you. Like, muster it up, right? Like, follow your heart. Gird up your, yourself and go after your dreams or whatever. The gospel says the problem is inside of you, and the solution is outside of you. The issue is that we cannot, we cannot with ourselves manufacture, produce, over a long period of time, earn righteousness. It has to be given to us. It has to be credited to us. It has to be, to use a theological term, imputed to us. And what happens in the gospel is that our sins, which are ours, they're not just like technically ours. They're ours. It's us. Our sins are imputed to Christ, and his righteousness is imputed to to us. We see the gospel start to come through very clearly in Genesis 15. He knows, God knows, that Abram's greatest need is not land or a home on earth. His greatest need is not a son or children or offspring to take care of the family business or to be an heir. His greatest need is righteousness before God. He's a sinner and he needs to be made holy. And when he takes him, God is promising these things. And Abram is, is walking and understands these things, but starts to understand as, as the child is delayed. As the child is delayed, what, what is Abram learning? He's learning that God is the one. That God is the one that he needs. It's not just something that God can give. It is God himself. God himself is the treasure 
God makes him righteous. One of the key arguments in Paul is that Abram's righteousness preceded the law. For those who considered Abram as their father in the faith and Moses as their lawgiver, had they ever stopped to think about the fact that the law came so much later, particularly well after Abram was long dead, and as well as, as, point, as, well as this point in which he was credited with righteousness. I love Romans 4.18 that we read a moment ago. In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. And this reminds us of Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. And here is where it gets to the point of glorifying God. What happens next? Look at verse 12. This is interesting because this is, this is kind of a, it's kind of a, a, like a hard left turn, you know, after this promise. No, you're going to have a son. Okay. What are my people going to be like? You know, like, what are they going to do? Are they going to be good at this? Are they going to be good at that? You know, he said, well, they're going to sojourn in a land that's not their own. And they're going to be in slavery for 400 years. Gut punch, right? Gut punch. As the sun was going down, it says, And behold, a dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. Here's, here's the deal with, uh, this is interesting. Um, the dreadful and great darkness, often mixed with the hope of God fulfilling his promises, is the heavy and dark reality that there is suffering in the path of obeying God. And hope is more of a pinhole of light than the sun at full strength, right? Don't you find that? Don't you find that, that walking with the Lord is, here's a promise, and then here's suffering that comes along with the promise in the path of obedience. And when we think about hope, we think that hope would be like, bah, you know, like angels singing and sun shining at full strength. And hope in Christ mainly is like dark skies and clouds open up and there's God's promise and his gospel coming through. I can imagine, I can, actually I can't imagine, Abram being at this point, hearing about this promise, hearing about this promise and hoping and hoping and hoping and then hearing they're going to be slaves for multiple generations. Here's what's crazy. Abram is assured he'll have offspring, but they'll be sojourners, servants, afflicted for 400 years. But eventually God will bring him out. But that means for many generations, they'll be born and grow up and die slaves in Egypt. One of the most humbling truths is that so many times God's work is stretched beyond the lifetime of one person and sometimes several people just so that we will not boast, but that he will get the glory. You think about how often we want this to happen. We often want for <clears throat> the Lord to start really working in the world when we turn like 20, right? Like when we get serious about the Lord, we think that that's when the Lord should get serious about the Lord. And we start to see all of the suffering in the world, and we're like, Lord, like, why don't you do it? Here's what we need to understand. Like, like our lifetime, and then we want his work to like conclude like around 70. You know? Like we want the Lord's work to like fit our lifetime of coming of age and retirement. And what the Lord is making clear to Abram is, Abram, I am going to get the glory. Yes, I will be glorified in your life. But over time, this is my story. This is about me. 
This is about my glory. This is about my salvation. This is about my people. Yes, you will have a son. And yes, you will have a people. But Abram, they will be my people. They will be my people. I will receive the glory of your life. He played a role, but he wouldn't see the promised land. But God saw all and gets the glory. And here's number four. God provides the payment to give us his own righteousness. He provides the payment to give his righteousness and is glorified in our lives. At the beginning, we talked about credit cards. I mentioned at some point that you have to pay the bank back. And for anybody who's ever had a credit card, that ended up being longer than you ever intended it to be. But you do it eventually, right? So, is that how it works with God? He credits you with righteousness now, and then you spend the rest of your life paying him back for what he's done? No. Not at all. That's why the next part of the story is so important. He's already told him to take these animals, to cut the big ones in half, to take the birds. He didn't cut them in half. And then he tells them about this, and about this, how he's going to receive glory. And then when it gets dark completely, there's a smoking oven and a torch, and it's passing between the the, the pieces. So like he sets them opposite each other, and it goes around this one and kind of this one like a figure eight, you know. And when in the Old Testament there's a phrase to make a covenant, the actual phrase in the actual vernacular of the Hebrew is to cut a covenant. And here's the idea. The purpose of doing this is that the person who's making the covenant is saying, so shall it be of me if I don't keep up my end of the covenant. So the Lord is saying, you sacrifice these animals and I am going to pass through them and I'm going to assure you based on who I am that I will bring this about. I am giving you a visual, a promise that so will it be for me that the Lord would be split, which is impossible. And that's the point. That's the point. He's given us assurance. So shall it be of me if I do not take up the end of my covenant. Abram does exactly what the Lord tells him to do to get some animals. And God makes a covenant with him. He then cuts a covenant with him. Who is going to make this happen? God. God himself. So then when we come to the New Testament... And Jesus takes our sin and he dies on the cross. This is God's covenant with us. When we take the Lord's Supper, we say that phrase that Jesus says, this is the new covenant of my blood. That means I'm the one. I'm the sacrifice. I'm also the covenant maker. And I'm making these things come about. That if you believe in me, if you trust in me, you will have your sins washed away. And I am am putting myself on the line for you in your place assuring you that these things are true, that you will come to be with me one day. That's what it says in John 14, 6. They're very troubled. And he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Right? If you believe in God, if you trust in God, trust also in me where I'm going. I will come again to receive you to myself. I will come again. So those are the things that I wanted us to see from this morning. The Lord is good to us. He's good to Abram. He's good to us to give us promises and for us to receive these promises. And uh, I would ask you to, uh, to bow with me now in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the truths that, that um, as we read through this scripture, that they rise to the top, that we're able to see and understand more of who you are. And that these are not just words on a page, but Father, this is an event that was happening. And, and even in the way that you've written it to us, You are showing us more of yourself. You're teaching us about the truths of your word. Father, for us who are here, I pray that we would respond just by simply knowing this, that we can trust you. And that the fulfillment of the promise does not depend upon you, but from beginning to end and all of the middles in between, that you are the one sovereign, that you are the one bringing this about. So, Lord, help us to trust you. Help us to trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. For a time of response, I'd like for us to meditate on these things. And uh, I am going to be at my seat and uh, singing as well. If you need to come see me, then come grab me by the arm and pray. Otherwise, find me after the service. But let's stand and uh, let's meditate on what the Lord has told us this morning. I've given you my heart and all that is within. 
lay it all down for the sake of you, my King. I'm giving.